All right. We are live, and hopefully if anyone's watching, they can hear us. I'm here with Professor Jim Madden and John Buck, and they're going to be discussing the simulation hypothesis. And it's just going to be, you know, open, free-flowing dialogue. And if anybody has questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and since Jim hasn't been on the channel before, I'll let him introduce himself and share whatever um, he'd like to. Um, so I'll go ahead and take it away. Hi, I'm Jim Madden. I, uh, I pay most of my bills teaching philosophy. So, um, you, you, can, you can hear more from me at Philosophy from the People or Causing Gram Dialogue. I'm on those shows pretty regularly. So, Yeah, and I put a link to his channel in the description, so definitely check it out. They do a lot of philosophy over there. And then, um, yeah, John, I don't know if you wanted to share anything or you just wanted to present your case or i i, I don't really have a, a, a case uh, per se uh my channel i i finally after like uh, almost a year and a half of no word at all i released a video just sort of responding to a conversation that uh pat flynn and jim madden were having regarding the, the simulation hypothesis and just sort of was sharing my thoughts and then from that this sort of sparked this conversation um and i think I don't know. It, it, it'll be interesting just to sort of just to get a better understanding of like what each of us are sort of meaning by the simulation hypothesis and get a yeah. better, clearer understanding between the two of us. That should be really helpful, I think. Yep, very good. And and okay. And John, can you um, just so I know because we've not this is like this is the first time we've met. Yeah. Tell me, tell me a little about you. So you're, uh, yeah. What, 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 are you an engineer? For some reason, I thought you were an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No, uh, no, no. Sorry. No, uh, let's see. I'm somebody that enjoys, I guess, writing in my spare time, but professionally, uh, I, w I work in a lab, so it's not really related cool. to philosophy or cool. anything like that. But oh, I yeah. enjoy philosophy and uh, became a recent Catholic convert last cool. Easter um, through apologetics and uh, interest in the sort of theology yeah. of Thomas Aquinas and the Catholic church. So, but, uh, anyway, I, I, you know, I've had you know, it sort of, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, and, and I, I would, I would beg you don't apologize for not being a professional philosopher. I think one <laughs> of the good things about things like this, like, like, like a guy like you with your own show or Caleb with your own show is it is like in a very healthy way, completely kind of like effing up the academic hierarchy right these in a really really good yeah. way okay and it and i think i think in a healthy way for academics right in that it's forcing a lot of academic people to like get outside of specializations and all this stuff and answer these kinds of questions and like maybe learn from people that they like a generation ago they wouldn't have thought to learn from do you see what i mean so oh yeah yeah I, definitely I, I, mean, I, I love yeah i don't I, see philosophy as something that is like uh is is cordoned off for a group of experts right yeah 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 like anyone I, I can read love, the books <laughs> yeah exactly and yeah. i love how like this sort of recent sort of i don't know with all, uh, covid and everything people are very much stuck at home but it's sort of give opened up this sort of window for a lot of professional philosophers to be like introduced able to be interacting with the people that are reading all their material yeah. and be able to sort of talk to a lay level and i think that's both good for the, the professional side and being able to better communicate yeah. that way and also better for the lay level side to sort of heighten their le intellectual level to get a better understanding of the philosophy from the professionals yep, totally agreed 100 percent Cool. So, John, why don't why don't we do this? Um, why don't you lay out? Because uh, I think this is part of where we're missing each other. Because I I mm -hmm. think I'm I was not a hundred percent clear on this, right? What What do you mean by simulation hypothesis? I think that would help me a lot. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think there's two sorts of broad simulation hypotheses that are sort of out there in the pop culture. One would be where we ourselves aren't like real organisms. We're just sort of digital simulants on some sort of computer somewhere. And we just have all the um, phenomenal representations of a physical organism yep. um, within that sort of domain, like in the Sims world or Minecraft or any sort of video game, you would have those characters and they would have like spatial dimensions sort of, but those are just like pixels represented on a screen. And so there's this uh, like, um, a popular movie is uh, Tron, where that that the character there's some characters or like um, algorithms in there that have a sort of 
digital representation as Jeff Bridges or <laughs> something like that. And but they themselves are just sort of like products within the um, digital domain. And then there's the other sort of simulation hypotheses, which is more to do with like the matrix, which is uh, where there are physical human organisms that are just in basically like a dream or a fugue state of some sort that is able to be manipulated digitally through um, some sort of interaction between the human brain and the digital interface uh, to the point that the people that are living out their lives are doing it so from only within a sort of phenomenal representation of the world. And so, you know, if, you, if you've seen The Matrix, then you uh -huh. kind of get that idea. And anyway, Nick Bostrom, he laid out, I think in like the early 2000s, this sort of paper regarding the probability space of if, let's see, there's sort of like three possible scenarios where a post-civilization society well, which is just to refer to like a society that is fully capable of basically producing simulations that are high with a high fidelity, where it's uh, for those that are within a simulation are not able to like dis differentiate it from the real world. Um, Post-civilization societies are incapable of creating such simulations. That's one like possible option in the probability space. The another possible option is post-civilization societies that are capable of making these types of simulations uh, are just not interested in doing so. Either they're not interested out of their own means, or maybe they have some sort of ethical standard that's sort of preventing them from making these types of simulations that are indistinguishable from reality. And then the third probability space is, no, they are interested and they are capable of producing these sorts of simulations. And there's going to be more than one of these types of simulations that are created. So um, because there's going to be more than one simulated reality versus uh, one real reality, there's going to be a higher probability in that lowest tier that if you happen to find yourself in a world that you cannot distinguish whether it's a simulated world or a real world, that you're more likely to be in one of the simulated worlds than the real worlds just because there's such a higher number, even if it's yeah. just like, two <laughs> two to one yep. you're there's just a high, greater poss possibility so the sort of argument is that like if these two things are sort of improbable that like it's it's possible for some sort of highly technologically advanced society to create these sorts of high fidelity simulations that's a possibility and if it's probable that they would have some interest in producing these sorts of simulations like in the paper i think he laid out a uh, sort of like scenario of like ancestor simulations where um future societies are just interested in sort of like provide uh, producing these sorts of simulations that are just like real the real history just so that it gave them a better understanding of like what life was like in 2022 or something like that um but there's a, a variety of other sort of motivations that you could use to sort of motivate why these sort of post-civilization societies might even be interested in creating these sorts of simulations. Anyway, that's this sort of like broad understanding of like what the yeah. simulation hypothesis is. Okay, so um, there, there's like so many cool questions to go with on this. Okay, so um, before, like, okay, so you've got two basic types of simulation, right? You've got that we are ourselves digital avatars in something like uh, a grand video game, right? That, that's mm -hmm. the first option, right? And then you've got basically what is like from the movie The Matrix. It's just a variation on the theme of the brain and the vat, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, now, the paper you're referring to does it motivate? What like d does he see himself as motivating one over the other of those two options? I think yeah. He Nick Bostrom is more inclined towards the avatar digital avatars within a video game sort of scenario yeah. he has this other book uh, super intelligence which is all to do with uh, general artificial intelligence and within that he sort of like makes a case that like if you emulate a brain digitally then you're more most likely to get a sort of conscious uh entity within that sort yeah. of email, uh, yeah. digital emulation i'm not as inclined towards that sort of yeah, view yeah, yeah. just because yeah. like john Searle's yeah. sort of chinese room uh argument it's kind of right uh, yeah. like heavily weighs against functionalism but yeah. I, I that is at least how he yeah. sort of presents the argument 
No, we, we talk about this later. I, I used to be a huge fan of Chinese room, and now I don't think it works. But oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. But let's let's just hold on. This could get very cool. Sure. But, but let's hold on. So, um, let's leave aside AI questions. Let's just grant him that. Let's just give him that. Do you know what I mean? Like AI is a possibility. Mm -hmm. You could get conscious machines. Okay. Um, I guess my first question I have for the original like Bostrom paper is, and I haven't read it. Unless you go, I'm now I'm going to go do it now. You're going to make me like be a better scholar. Okay. So, um, is why would you think the game theory that we use here now within the simulation as a prediction of probability spaces for rational behavior would hold for beings outside the simulation? So yeah, I, I think, yeah, no, go ahead. Elaborate. Yeah, I, mean, I think you have a similar issue when you start talking about like what uh, alien intelligence would do if it showed up here. Like we always assume, well, if they showed up here, we'd expect them to be broadly self-interested creatures. We'd be doing this, 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 and this, and this. But it seems to me like there's no reason to think that that game, our game theory for our behavior would carry over to them, right? If they're utterly foreign to us. Do you see that? Um, and it seems like there's this assumption built into the argument, and, and I, I don't want to be unfair to the author here, right? Because I'm, I'm getting it secondhand, right? There's this assumption uh, on the part of the author is that the game theory for predicting behavior that's apparent to us would apply outside the simulation. But it seems to me we don't have good reason to think that we have much in common in terms of, um, you know, practical intent with those with those beings, whatever they would be. Do, do you see that? And so I don't even know to what degree you can say we can, like, assign probability, uh, you know, spaces, right? without this big assumption that we would expect them to be similarly motivated to to us, right? And I don't see a reason to assume that up front. I got you. Yeah, yeah. I guess, like, maybe one area would be, like, if we think that us, like, if we were to reach, like, our society, if we were to reach yeah. a sort of, like, uh, technologically advanced uh, stage of development in which we could create these types yeah. of simulations, and if we ourselves recognize there are uh, a variety of um, motivations within ourselves for creating yeah. these types of simulations, um, then we could, I guess, presume that other species or uh, societies that are also reach that sort of point of development would also have a similar set of motivations behind it themselves. Right, right. Uh, and see, there, there, that it, it's okay. Um, okay. I guess if you're saying it, we would expect it to have evolved out of us, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but once we entertain the possibility um, that maybe like our, like the story we're in, right, as best we can tell, isn't the full story, or isn't the real story, right? It could just be a simulated story, right? Then um, it would seem then that you you could, you have to entertain then the possibility that there is something outside of the simulation entirely, right? And mm -hmm. I don't see any, any reason to believe that, like, that, like, like it could just be part of the simulation we're in. That that this is what it would be if we evolved to that point that we could do oh, it. Do you see that? Yeah, yeah, I see. Right, like maybe right. they they program the sim to. Uh, yeah. They program the characters within the sim to have certain ideas about what would yeah. happen outside the sim. Let's make these little self-interested monkeys that are going to like want to do this, and then they couldn't help yeah. but like to like like f around with the past, right? You know, once they got to a certain point. Do you see that? Um, and it seems like you have to say that that's if, if you're going to take seriously the simulation hypothesis. And I'm not saying we shouldn't take it seriously. Then it seems like you've got to take it seriously. There could have been an entirely different kind of game theory, right? That would apply to rational animal, rational beings, right? And mm -hmm. if that's the case, then I think it's then then I think we've just lost our ability to make probabilistic assignments now. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, there's a way in which I'm like thinking about your argument, but I, I think it's probably not the way that you're intending it. Where I'm yeah, yeah. the way I'm thinking of it, like, okay, if there was creatures that did simulate a type of reality, there would probably be some sort of similarity or commonality enough between them because that would be the only reason that they would be interested in like the only reason we would be interested in creating a simulation is if the simulation is bears some resemblance to our reality so that way it informs us about um oh what our past was like or oh what um yeah. might be a useful but, strategy in the future but, but, but your no, point you, is that you yeah. went right there you assume they were like us like the mm -hmm. only reason we would do it would be for these reasons yeah but but we're not talking about us we're talking about these extra right. simulatory beings and i don't that they would be beyond our ken if there were such things yeah i, I guess i'm not seeing that 
significant um, differentiation. Because like yeah. the way that I'm imagining the simulation overlords, <laughs> and, yeah, 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 just I like to put it out there, I'm not actually like a simulationist guy. I, I just think that it's a yeah. argument worth taking seriously. And I find within my camp that it's not taken seriously enough. And yeah. so that's why I'm sort of like- no, I'm, I'm actually going to come there. out and be here and defend it, but but not okay. on these yeah, grounds. Yeah. yeah, okay, go okay. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. Okay. Um, and I think the, um, I guess if we expect that our types of, yeah, I guess I'm just sort of making the same sort of argument that like uh, in a, a society that's techn so technologically advanced as to create simulations is going to bear some resemblance to us if we reach this sort of state of technological advancement. But you're sort of wanting to like cut that off at the knees by saying, well, no, we have no reason to expect that they'd be like us because it could yeah. be that they reach this point of technological advancement with bearing no sort of similar uh yeah. game theory that we have and so their variety of interests are just not going to be relevant to us at all yeah. and so that gives us a reason the point you're making it to just not have even any probabilistic sort of assignment to place yeah. on the proposition of whether such a society would be interested in creating this simulation yeah. and yeah. i guess I don't know. It, it almost sounds like skeptical, skeptical theism to me in a sense. And I think that, um, there's, I, I think like, it is actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's where yeah. I learned it. I, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, an adequate response from the atheist to the skeptical theist hypothesis is to just sort of say, okay, so, um, there's these unknown. Okay. Um, how, how is it? My Michael Cooley sort of response, but basically that, we have unknown reasons to think that God would, sorry, the, the general skeptical theist argument is like, we don't know what sort of re reasons God might have for allowing evil to occur. Michael Tooley will also want to say like, okay, we do have some known reasons as to why we, why God should not allow certain types of evil to occur. And we also have unknown reasons as to why God would not allow certain evils to occur. So like the, the unknown, we have two unknowns here, unknown reasons why God would allow these to occur and unknown reasons why God would not allow these to occur. And these are equal in some sense because we, we don't we can't assign any sort of probability yeah. to either one. But we do have the known reasons like we ourselves know that like being in pain is a negative state. And yep. when a person is capable of preventing that sort of negative state, they have a reason to prevent that. And so that's the sort of like Tulian response. And, and there's others that have made the same yep. case. Uh, to skeptical theism. And so that same sort of argument can apply to uh, the argument you're sort of presenting. Like we have unknown reasons as to why simulation creators would create simulations. We also have unknown reasons as to why simulation creators would not create a simulation. And so they're going to yeah. be equal in some sense. But as yeah. long as like from our own perspective, we do have reasons to recognize why a simulation creator might create a simulation, that's going to win out overall because yeah. it's most epistemically certain, I guess. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, great. I, I, um, but I think like my, you know, kind of my way of thinking about like, the reply to the, the Thule reply thing is, is to say, look, um, it's, yeah, it's clear, like we, we, like we would have reasons to not do it this way. Right. But like God is this sort of epistemic game changer. Right. And, and who we don't, we shouldn't expect that our game theory would necessarily apply to God. Right. Do you know what I mean? And so then I, I do think you can't say it is like that our reasons are predictions on God's reasons, right? And thereby the fact that we run out of reasons about these evils somehow means that God would have no reasons, right? But but that doesn't mean though, like, oh voila, like we know there's a reason for this, right? Okay, like you're still gonna have to have a good argument for God's existence, like to, to make that work. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Or it's gotta be properly basic or whatever, whatever your jam is for that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, likewise, like say for the simulation, is like, okay. I think we could say, yeah, we, in this case, we would say we, if we were running the universe, we would have good reasons to simulate it, right? We would expect ourselves to do it, right? Mm -hmm. But now we've got this, the fact though is we have no reason up front to assume whoever, whoever's running the simulation is like us, right? And thereby the game theory breaks down. Do you see that? So yeah. I would then say independent of some reason to think that there are simulators, right? Who have no good reason to say that they're, that, that, that there's an unknown reason to do it this way. Do, do you see that? Um, it's like in in I, I think in order for skeptical theism to work, you got to have some independent reason to think God exists, right? For to actually mm -hmm. answer the atheist, right? Uh, in my understanding of it, right? Whereas mm -hmm. and, and same thing here, I think you'd have to have some independent reason to think the simulators exist 
in order for me to start looking for reasons of why this might be it, right? Whereas it sounds, and once again, I'm, I'm going to read the paper and I'll, I'll do something responsible with this, right? Um, it sounds to me though, um, like I, we, just my point is, I don't think we can help ourselves to a game theory unless we already have like 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 the game our game we can't help ourselves to our game three to set the probabilities right because we, we would we would have reason to, to wonder whether their game theory would be at all like ours so unless we have some independent reason to argue that there are simulators i don't see a case here to even to set the probabilities okay so just want to clarify the reason yeah. you bring up game theory is to do with like the sorts of interests that they would have because like in yeah, the paper how we that... predict behavior rational behavior okay yeah. gotcha Gotcha. Okay. Because the way that uh, Bostrom sort of lays out the paper is just in a sort of Bayesian sort of probabilistic yeah. space where, yeah. and I think, like, I guess sort of using that sort of route is like, if we have unknown reasons as to why an agent would act in one way or act in another way, we should maybe assign a sort of equal probable sort of uh, e equal probability yeah, probable, to their yeah. Acti yeah. Yeah, acting in either way. And so like, it's, yeah. if it, if we have no reason to think that like, a hyper advanced civilization that is nothing at all like us would be interested in yep. creating a simulation. We should assign an equal probability uh, to them having an interest in yep. uh, creating a simulation. And so, yeah, I'm, it, it seems so, like so you're wanting to say I'll give them can't rule against, it out. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll give them can't rule it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. For all we know. Do you see what I mean? So I, I, th I, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy to concede. Yeah. For all we know. Right um epistemically pro uh, epistemically possible right but if, if we're trying to push it to like it's probable based on like those kinds of like like game theoretic speculations what of simulators would do if there were some i'm very skeptical about that but i do think if we've got some reason to say yeah we can't rule out that there are such things right then it's okay 50 50 i'll give you that. I, I i i'm comfortable with that does that make sense right okay yeah yeah so yeah. like if we were to assign a 50 50 probability to a hyper advanced technological society would be interested to in creating a simulation. Yeah. I think that's still going to allow the probabilistic argument from Bostrom to go through because like all it really requires is like, okay, so there's a three sort of propositions. If one's mm -hmm. at 50-50 um, and another's at, uh, well, I'm trying to, I, I guess, would it be like 25%? Then that would leave 25% for the third proposition, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I, I feel like yeah, actually... yeah, I had to. Go. My, yeah. my wife's a statistician. I'm about to call her up here, right? <laughs> right <yeah. laughs> That's what you're yeah. saying. Is like, yeah, okay. So we got 50 50 that one of two options is going to occur, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, the I, speculation does that put us at 25 on each of those, right? Right. I might, I might be getting this all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should yeah. probably actually like write it yeah. out. But okay. There was a few um, points that you had made in, in your conversation that I do want to bring up. It, like, if you want, we can carry on with this or. Sure. I, I do want to bring up the, these other points oh, cool. that you'd made. Um, you had sort of brought up how if there's no sort of empirical difference between whether we live in a simulated reality versus a real reality, then that sort of makes the whole notion um, cognitively insignificant. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, what is it you mean by that? Because there's a yeah. sense in which I hear that and it was like, I'm almost hearing the sort of verificationist principles back from the 1920s coming back where yeah. um, in order for a proposition to be cognitively meaningful, it must be able to, in principle, uh, be verified through our sense data or through empirical yeah. observations of some sort. And I don't think that you're a verificationist, but I just want to make sure here. Yeah, well, did I say sense data? No, well, okay. you, yeah. we had yeah. you had mentioned empirical data, uh, like empirically, it's going to be equivalent yeah. between... Living in a simulated reality. I, I'm sure I said falsifiable, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, and, and, and I would say, yeah, I, I don't think there are meaningful non-falsifiable uh, synthetic propositions, mm. right? Um, but that doesn't mean that the only means of falsification are empirical, like in, in like the crass sense of empiricism that you'd find in like logical positivism, right? Okay. So I, I think, I mean, like, for instance, like like Popper, you know, coined the term, right? Falsifiable. And he's not, he's not a logical positivist, right? And like, okay. like, like Quine is like, like in his, in his rejection of logical positivism, he's saying, but he still thinks everything is always put against the bar of some kind of experience, right? Now he's got a pretty crass empiricist notion of what experience means, right? But he is saying is like, like for something to be cognitively significant, he thinks in principle, it has to be revisable. Like there are conditions where you could say I was wrong about it. Right. And see, for me, um, 
like this, this isn't, it's not the positivist point. It's the Wittgensteinian point that like, if there's no way I could be wrong about something, there's really no sense in which I could be right about it. Right. Um, to, like to make a, a, a synthetically significant claim is something that um, I am putting up against a reality and I'm standing up to say, I could be corrected about this. Right. I'm, I'm putting it in a space of reasons. Do you see that? Um, and so I worry about skeptical hypotheses in general, where uh, we just go, where we just, we're just going from, for all we know that this could be the case, right? And what would count for answering that, that, that skeptical hypothesis? There's just no, there's just no um, conditions under which we could like imagine ourselves being wrong about it. So we could go looking around for how we would evaluate it. It seems to me then what you what you said is now cognitively insignificant, right? This is what like Pittsburgh school people like Brandom and McDowell are saying when they say, "Look, uh, and the, it's it's content, right? To say that a claim has actual significant content is to say that there there is something right that grounds it in terms of like we could find out whether we're right or wrong about it, right? Now, in like the classical Kantian like view that's going to be literally like like impressions okay but like later more sophisticated version it's more just is it does it enter into a space of reasons wherein we could imagine ourselves being dis does that make sense right and so i worry about something if okay so let's say let's say um, the, but not, that's not what bostrom's doing like bostrom's saying no I'm, i've got an argument like i'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm saying like these probabilities based on these other things that are well known right are, are boosting the probability such that not even you can't rule it out but it probably is the case okay so Let's say though we're like a less sophisticated version of it, or let's say like I'm right about my hearsay objection to Bostrom, right? So that we only get 50-50. So it's just yeah, for all we know, we can't rule this out, right? Mm -hmm. Well then, okay, what would count for being wrong about that? Mm. You know, there's all sorts of things. Like I can always cook up something for all we know we can't be wrong about. I could do it ad hoc and trivially, right? That's but that's not a cognitively significant claim. It doesn't make a claim on me, right? That's what mm -hmm. I, that's what I mean by, by the verifiability of it, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that that is interesting because, like, I know that. Um, I guess. Hmm. So you're still wanting to be there's something that theoretically could falsify the notion that we're living within a simulation and something that we could. Um, I guess observe, or it, maybe it doesn't have to be empirical in some sense. Right. So, like, what would be another alternative? Like, would it just be like some sort of theoretical argument? Maybe be something. Yeah, to I mean that that might that might out. be it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and of course, though, all those claims themselves have to like pass the bar of, of truth and all this, and so like maybe we never ultimately sort yeah. stuff out, but we get degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I guess so this, then, yeah, like, that's what I think like Quine means when he says like there's certain things in the center of our web of belief that are are currently ungiveable, but we would revise them if reason showed up for it, right? Okay, so like I can imagine a sort of theoretical argument that would make simulation hypotheses just metaphysically impossible is if um, it is just metaphysically impossible to interface a um, mental subject with a physical digital um, representation or, or if it's just impossible to even simulate truly conscious subjects on a digital representation or a digital yeah. physical interface um yeah. like here's where maybe we can get into uh john searle's argument like if it's just not yeah. possible to like derive semantic meaning out of purely syntactic yeah. sort of uh modifications then it's going to be very hard uh n maybe impossible to get a conscious subject when yeah. you're just flipping switches back and forth but but couldn't it just be part of the simulation that that we're led to think that uh, well, this would be, I guess, a a priori argument by saying yeah. that, like, the mental and the physical are just completely yeah. different category areas. And the simulation argument yeah. presupposes that the mental can be simulated on the physical. And if that's just not, yeah. uh, if, if that's able to be ruled out a priori, yeah. now I guess you could say, like, well, maybe our categories for like what we can recognize um, in the simulation is something that was just programmed into us so that we recognize yeah. that we, we're but never able to. Yeah. Isn't that inherent in the simulation hypothesis? Our categories of like, we are simulants, right? And mm -hmm. so that our categories, our logical categories would then right. too be subject to the same worry, right? So it seems like anything, 
like like the simulation hypothesis to me now has become so um you know epistemically plastic like it, it, it's like people complain about theism on this and they're right to complain about this mm. if, you, if your theism is such that well hey no you know oh it turns out god could have done that oh wait oh wait yeah. we never thought this before because you objected to it we'll just adjust it right it's 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 russell's you know tea cop tea, you know tea kettle in the, in the sky thing and mm -hmm. i think that's legit right it's legit if like there's no there's no way i could just be wrong about theism that i'm not really sure what i'm claiming anymore right right uh likewise with this it seems like it's like something like a simulation hypothesis or descartes evil demon or all of these are so supple as to become trivial right right yeah i wonder if maybe then like sure it it, it is the case that a simulation uh hypothesis is going to be compatible with any sort of um argument and any sort of observation that we might make but there's still going to be things that we might initially think would be consistent with a simulation yep. hypothesis and when yep. those things fail to be uh observed or fail to come to fruition via argumentation then that gives us reason to discredit the simulation yep. hypothesis somewhat and i think yep. that's just a sort of like appropriate uh, epistemic principle that like you go from what you do know uh, yep. to rule out what you you don't know or or yep. to like make judgments yep. about what you don't know yep. and so like maybe it is the case that all of our categories are like um systematically embedded within us by the programmers but it's still going to be the case that for us within the simulation yep. um supposing we're, we're in a supposing yeah, yeah 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 our epistemically appropriate judgments for us to make would be ones in which we're utilizing the categories that we were embedded with and yep. we would still be um good epistemic actors by making these sorts of judgments um it, and if we were to yeah, sort yeah. of rule out things yeah. in an ad hoc way then this would be epistemically inappropriate yeah yeah i i agree okay. as long as we we have like the person pressing the simulation hypothesis can can provide us some sense that there is a constraint on the hypothesis like mm. there are like, it, there's a limit to which it could be stretched right um, yeah. Such that you see what I mean, right? That there is, and 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 that's what I don't quite see here, right? Right. Right. Yeah, I see that. So, right. would you say that under theism there is a sort of like limit to what can be stretched? Because it seems like if you accept skeptical theism, then it seems like yeah. there's no uh, limit <laughs> at, at all. Yeah, no. Because like yeah. any sort of uh, observation we could make, yeah. we could say, well maybe God has uh, moral reasons for allowing this yeah. to occur that are just outside well, you know, our ability to comprehend. Yeah. And I think this is like, you know, when people like, like Brian Davis um, object, like make pretty interesting objections to skeptical theism. Um, I think there's a, there's a good point in, in the background there, but I don't quite know how to deal with It's like, it seems like you you've made theism like so supple, right. As mm -hmm. to like, it could tolerate anything. And I don't really, and if we, if we go that far, like if we put like a concept that may be like trivial and empty in the center of our like web of belief now, then like, okay, well then that's going to have implications. It's going to make like morality now so supple yeah. that I don't really know how to make moral judgment anymore. It's going to make, so I think, I mean, although I've got like some pretty deep sympathies to skeptical theism, I think this is a point. This is a point any skeptical theorist should like really, really worry about. Right. And I think the analogy carries over the simulation hypothesis. Right. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I, I definitely see the sort of like uh, problems there uh, with the simulation hypothesis in that, yeah. like, for one, we don't understand what are the motivations for simulation creators. And so that doesn't give us a defined sort of understanding of like, OK, what would we expect to see in a simulation? And for two, yeah. uh, it's just like something that could be ad hoc sort of explained away to encompass any sort of uh, data that we might observe. I have a friend that like he gave this sort of analogy to like how we apply our theories to uh, our, our facts or our data as mm -hmm. like a glove, like either the glove is going to be too tight and you're going to like try to stretch it across yeah. to fit all the data that yeah. you have, or the glove is going to be way too loose. Any sort of data can just sort of fit in there. And it, yeah. what you will really want is to have something that like where the data just perfectly fits like a glove. But I, I definitely see that, um, yeah, the skeptical hypothesis is just going to be sort of uh inadequate and in, in sort of like giving us this sort of like clear yeah. definitions or expectations for what we should observe in a simulation yeah um, and and, and I'll, I'll just say in general and it's not just a simulation but i i do have worries about the cognitive significance of all like like generally skeptical mm -hmm. hypotheses do you see what i mean mm -hmm. um 
and like in and maybe as we go on like i, I kind of got like hegelian reasons for that too that we'll go on to right later but okay. but i want to hear like you said you had a couple of points you wanted to raise too so yeah so it's the okay. verified body thing and then what was the other yeah yeah um so i guess i i want to get a better understanding of like the cognitive significance because like for sure. me I think a proposition is cognitively significant insofar as the predicate is not like laden within the subject or with. Yep. Yeah. And it seems like if we're saying that, no, in order for a proposition to be cognitively significant, the uh, predicate must be in principle falsifiable through some sort of other thing at some point. And I'm, I'm just some, some procedure. Yeah. Yeah. some procedure and i'm wondering if yeah. that's just going to be i don't know too too far over because i guess i guess i could ask uh, in sort of like uh retreating to the response to the verification it's like okay is this sort of like principal uh application of like what is and what isn't cognitively significant is this <laughs> is this a theoretical uh supposition is this something that could be theoretically overturned through falsification at yeah yeah just does it apply to itself yeah 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 i mean the thing is i i think um yeah i don't know um i i think you you because it doesn't seem to be yeah. necessarily true so i it, it does seem like it's a synthetic sort of proposition and so and there's just going to be that question as to whether it can be falsified but, yeah sorry yeah i mean i i guess it, you know you could get into like arguments um from like Quine or even from Kant, right? That would like try to show show something like this, right? That that ev even necessary truths, right? In as much as they say anything, are going to have to like you, you, you're right, they're going to have to like mix right right two mm -hmm. concepts, right? Um, but then like what else would count, right? Um, for the mixing of two concepts, right? Then like some kind of discovery, right? um and so mm. if it's a discovery it seems like at one point this was you didn't know this was the case or humanity didn't know this was the case and it seems then like you've just got like this kind of historical suspicion that yeah we could have been wrong we were once wrong on this and so maybe we've been wrong we, we could be wrong again so it's it is something that's like laid out there right mm. but like against something that pushes back against us right i see and yeah and and i think like um you, you know like like if you some of the some of the arguments in like the early moments of like Hegel's phenomenology kind of really moved me on this where he says, look, I can't I can't make a judgment about something being here if I don't also I'm not also able to like juxtapose it to something that's there. Okay. And like for, for Hegel, like meaningful judgment presupposes contrastive judgment, right? Mm -hmm. Well grounded contrastive judgment. So it seems like I have to put it up against something, right? Mm -hmm. In order in order to and that and that means though it's like now now it's like I can imagine what it would be like to object to it, right? You know I mean? So for me to to judge it here, I implicitly know what it would be for it to have been there, right? So in, it entails, even though I don't think I'm wrong, and maybe I couldn't be wrong, it still entails an understanding of what it would have been to have been wrong. Do, do you see that, right? And I think that's it's that it's that that contrastive notion of judgment that you have in the German idealists that I find very very compelling, right? Hmm. That to make a judgment is also to implicitly to know what it would be to judge to the contrary right and you and you can't get it off the ground without both of them at once right mm -hmm. yeah okay so I, I guess just trying to think about like what could be something that in principle falsifies the simulation hypothesis and i think the only things that it's going to be is just like okay there's this bit of data that we would expect but um and we don't observe it um and now you could say that like, well, this bit of data that we do observe is also consistent with the with the um, hypotheses, yeah. but it's just not what was initially expected. And so it's an ad hoc sort of uh, modification to the, yeah. the hypotheses. And so that still counts as evidence against the hypotheses, even if it's not something that ultimately falsifies it, it still yeah. at least makes it less probable. Yeah. So maybe that would count as a yeah. quasi falsification, yeah. and, and maybe maybe like falsification is a, a a bad way for me to put it. It's just that it's for me to say judge the simulation hypothesis is true to make it like a, a meaningful judgment. There is also mm. to say in principle, um, I know what it would be to judge for it to be false. 
you see what I mean? Even if I, you see what I mean? Like, like, and, and it just seems to me like, like when you get something so supple as a simulation hypothesis, I'm not sure what I know that that contrastive case, right? Yeah. Or, or I, I think I shouldn't say that. I think the way people often talk about this, it's just, it's like Descartes' evil demon. Well, he could have done this. He could have done this. He could have done this. He could have done this, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, I, I hate to do this again, but no, no, like, do you think that this sort of like consideration also applies to theism then? Like to say, to make the cognitive judgment that yes, there is a God, there is a purely actual being that whose yeah. essence is identical to his existence. Is this something that you could like imagine, I guess, this sort of hypothesis being false um, in some sense? Yeah, I, I um, yeah, well, one, I, I worry about this. Okay. And I, th I think if there is a good, I, I look, I think the best objection to philosophically grounded theism, right, is Kant's from the critique, even though the guy's ultimately a theist. I really do think the best objection, it's, 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 and basically it's something like this. He's saying, look, in order for us to make sense of things rationally, it's got to be, it's got to be conceptual and it's got to be intuitive, meaning it, it actually, it, it, we can talk about how we would go about finding it out. And he doesn't think we can. Okay, and, and he thinks like he thinks all arguments are ontological arguments, which he thinks are completely disconnected from any grounded finding out, right? Mm. So if you ask me, like, what is the objection to theism I most worry about? It's this objection to theism, right? right? It's not evil. It's not. It's not the failure of the arguments. It's this objection, right? Do you yeah. see what I mean? So yeah, I think it's a legitimate worry for theists. To hold, I think it's right. the legitimate worry for theists, right? Yeah, it is interesting too because, like, Kant being a sort of like fideist, he's not yeah. like saying this is an argument against theism as a truth, but rather against the epistemic ability for us to even like arrive yeah. at theism yeah. as a truth. Yeah, um, and and so, um, and so, so, but that's why I think it's important for me to say, yeah, I guess there probably is some distribution of evil, right? That would just be enough to say, God. It's wh whoever's running this thing is not someone worth worshiping, right? right? Or there's some distribution of chaos or something. I have to hold out, even if I don't know what it is, to hold out that there's some there would be some deal breaker for me. And I'd say the same thing about the faith too. If if the faith is going to be cognitively significant, and it's not just unhinged from reason entirely. I have to say that there's something like the church could do where I'd say, yeah, I guess I was wrong about you, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm not saying it's happened or even know what it is, but I think I I think I have to say in principle there is such a, a line that could be crossed yeah 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 definitely and, and i i do definitely see that at least within the catholic faith that there's been certain declarations by the church that it seems like if we were to observe certain things that go into yeah. conflict with those declarations that it's going to show at least that the yeah. church is not infallible and so like maybe anglicanism is more probable account yeah. of sort of yeah. church ecclesiology um yeah. But uh, there is also the worry, too, that, like, there have been things that have been supposedly declared that um, maybe, as of late, are less inclined. But that's going to be a different yeah. ar argument. But I mean, that, yeah, okay, but yeah. And here we are working it out in fear and trembling, right? You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, that that's actually really good feedback right. from you. And to, like, in order for the simulation hypothesis to be anything more than just mental masturbation or anything like that, yeah. there's going to have to be some sort of like actual predictions of some sort that the simulation hypothesis would actually sort yeah. of provide us with. Empirical or cognitive. You know, like, okay. There's a lot of ways we could have data here. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. And you're right to say, look, you're Jim, you're not like coming out for like AJ air phenomenalism or something like that. No, I'm not. Right. I'm not. Yeah. Okay. At all. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. God forbid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's good though. Yeah. Uh, cool. it, it, it is interesting. So like about three years back, I actually did a debate on the simulation hypothesis with a, a guy from, I talked to on Twitter and I probably wouldn't like make the same argument that I did at that point, but the, I was making a sort of evidential uh, case for the simulation hypothesis based upon certain findings within science that run in conflict with our sort of like, realist notion common sense yeah. realist notion of the world of things like non-locality within quantum yeah. mechanics uh, or like varieties of um uh like in information uh being retained even when objects fall into a black hole those sorts of things that like it seems like would come in conflict with a sort of like three-dimensional uh realist picture of the world yeah. and i'm not sure if it's exactly like argument it's not a, like an argument favoring the simulation hypothesis but is it at least arguing against 
the common sense realist sort of position. And even then it's only doing so minimally. It's just a few yeah. evidential chips. And yep. so like, is it the case that like, if you have these two hypotheses and one's sort of the assumption, and then you have evidence against that, that you're yeah. suddenly favoring the simulation hypotheses, or maybe a scattering of all of these other, like um, yeah. the, the, the Hinduistic notion of like the world is sort of like all one thing that's within the mind of Brahma or something like that. Cause that's like another sort of like thing that would be consistent with the, quantum yeah, mechanical okay. weirdness that yeah. we observe here um so and i go yeah ahead. yeah go ahead well okay, i was so, just gonna say <laughs> you go ahead no, no. well so i want to make i want to make like kind of a distinction of two ways to motivate the, the simulation hypothesis i guess i have three ways now um and i'm actually i'm sympathetic to i'm very sympathetic to one of them okay so you've got something like was it bostrom's argument where he's gonna like like do this bayesian probability uh way to motivate it okay in which case um i'm 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 not maybe I should be more impressed by it than I am, but I'm not impressed by it, right? Just because I think I think it's assuming this thing that we can step outside and know what the simulators would be doing. Okay. So let me just set that aside. Let's suppose let's suppose we can set that aside. Then you've got to kind of like, you know, the the uh the guy who's seen the matrix who says, Hey, for all we know, this is the case, right? In which case I don't think that's falsifiable now. Okay, or it's not common sense. So let me set that aside. Okay, but if you start talking like um non locality in, in physics. Okay, so now you're now you're not saying, well, for all we know, you're saying no, like there's something going on, right? That, that grounds me in something, in this case, literally empirical experience at some level, right? That's get like now now the, the hypothesis just got like cognitively significant in my view, and you've got evidence for it, right? Do, do you see what I mean? Okay. So when you start motivating it on those sorts of things, I think it's becoming much more interesting to me. It's not just an empty evil demon for all we know. It's like, well, this is an account, right? of things like you can tell me what the world would be like if it were true you'd have non-locality or something like that right um and here it is there's non-locality okay um other things that, that kind of move me on this is is okay whether you like like i'm very moved by uh the french phenomenologist uh merleau ponty okay and ponty makes very very interesting arguments about how like using Husserl's terminology, he doesn't think the natural attitude is something we can just help ourselves to, which is just the common sense three-dimensional view of the world. Because he's like, Wait, look, we know that organisms do a lot to select what phenomena are relevant to them. Okay. And so like, he's like, what, what we're getting is always at best a narrowing of the possibilities of experience solely for the sake of like making something manageable for the organism. Okay. And it's sort of a, a phenomenological biological way of arguing for a kind of Kantian view here, right? That what yeah. we're getting is filtered through our organic needs. It's not just like we open up our eyes and there's stuff there. It's like, no, our ability to deal, right? Partly de determines what we're going to deal with. And so you got this like loop and, and, and he says like, we can never just step out and say, aha, right? Our way of framing it's right because it always presupposes our practical organic way of framing it okay that's a kind i think a kind of simulation hypothesis where in this case the, who's putting the simulation on isn't the simulators it's not the evil genius it's us right it's our organic biological comportments doing it right yeah okay and and there once again like and and there's people who you know like uh you know uh Don Hoffman. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah. So Don Don yeah. Hoffman's a great example, cognitive science. Yeah. He's done the math on it. He's done the math on it, right? That if you got evolving animals, you would not expect them to come out with like common sense realism. You expect to come out with a highly constructed, maybe even distorting picture because it got them dates, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so I find those arguments pretty darn interesting. Okay. Um, and that would kind of like be a way of non-trivially motivating something like digital hypothesis here, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, maybe it's not literally digital, but like using that metaphor, right? Where yeah. you know, what we're getting is like a screen or like a dashboard with with meters on it, right? And that's what we're getting. Okay, it's a simulation we're putting on for ourselves to get ourselves around. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I find that, so that to me is cognitively significant and you've got evidence for it. And now it seems like this is something that should be entertained, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I, my worry, but the th so my worry about that is like the very thing like Hegel raises to Kant's version of this, right? And so in, in the, in the introduction of the phenomenology of spirit, uh, Hegel brings up, you know, Kant's argument to say that what we're getting is not reality itself it's the schematized version of it that's set up for us okay and um you know, 
Hegel at one point says, but yet in order for us to have this conversation, he says, we have to be able to go behind the back of consciousness. Okay. But we have to be able to go behind the back of consciousness. And I think what's going on there is he's saying, look, on, in the video game, there's an avatar on the screen, right? Okay. And me as the video game player, right? I'm not the avatar. I'm, I'm the one who's aware of the avatar. Do, do, do you see that? So I'm aware of the simulation as a simulation. Okay. And the claim that there is a simulation is not itself a simulation. If there's a simulation, it has to be like numinally true that there is a simulation. Okay. So for, for Hegel, in as much as I'm aware of reality as a simulation presupposes that me, I as a self-conscious subject am standing outside of it. I have gone around the back of consciousness and I'm looking in it from the outside as it were. Do you see that? And that's what, when I said in the original podcast, when um, I think if the simulation hypothesis were true and were available to us, then it's actually not true because we're standing outside of it, looking in on it. Do, do, do you see that? Okay. Yeah. Now, and then now Hegel's point is, okay, now I'm going to like show you how we can connect this like transcendental perspective, which Kant's aware of this too. I can show you how we can like connect this transcendental perspective and the simulated perspective to like collapse them so we get realism back. Yeah, okay, I'm not so sure we've done that. Through okay. idealism, yeah. <laughs> yeah, through idealism. Yeah, through idealism, right? Okay, and like if you look at a lot of the simulation people though, like, like what I think they are, they kind of go idealist, right? Okay, and they're going Hegel, right? They're going mm -hmm. Hegel, right? And, but I do think like, what, what do we think about idealism? I do think this is a legitimate thing here. And, and for me, it's kind of an intractable paradox. It's like, we've got good evidence. It's very hard to resist the notion that like direct realism is done, right? And there's something like the organism is contributing to the environment that is available to it, right? But yet the fact that we're having this conversation means we're standing outside of it, looking at it, right? And I don't know how we can ever hook those two things up, right? Uh, so I do think there's kind of a like a paradox here. Right, mm -hmm. that Hegel like really hit on the head. Yeah. Hmm. So my view is spookier than you may have thought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like almost thinking that like, okay, the the way to sort of defeat the skeptical hypothesis within um, uh, the simulation hypothesis is to take on an even spookier, more skeptical approach than than even yeah. that by doubting the, the 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 doubts that brought us to the, yeah. the simulation hypothesis as a possibility. Yeah. Yep. It, 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 no, it's, it's definitely or, interesting. And it, or no, the no, fact that I can make the judgment that mm -hmm. there is a simulation mm -hmm. presupposes a kind of separation of myself from the experience that's simulated that would assume that, well, that I'm not in the simulation. I'm judging about it. Right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, I'll have to definitely think more about like the points that you're you're making here and like how how it would be applied to yeah. the simulation hypothesis and, and what you were saying there too about like the whole argument from the sort of like uh, adaptability of our experiences or, or like our experiences to uh, in accordance with what is adaptive for us as organisms yeah. is exactly like the same argument that Don Hoffman makes in his book the, the Case Against Reality to sort of yeah. arrive at this sort of Kantian position that yeah. the all of our sense data and experience uh, is sort of filtered through these sort of categories. And we have no reason to think that these categories are actually applicable to reality. In fact, we have reason to think they're not applicable to reality, yeah. given that we seem to be an evolved species whose yeah. cognitive faculties were evolved in order to help sustain us and uh, help us to survive. And so that gives us reason to think that, well, in order to help us to survive, we don't necessarily need to line up with reality. All we really need to do is line up with behaviors that helps to survive. And those sorts of behaviors need not perfectly correspond with reality. So they can like only imperfectly do so. Anyway, yeah, the argument he makes is quite interesting. And I, I wouldn't say that it like um, arrives at like the simulation hypothesis as a conclusion, but rather I think he uses it to motivate conscious realism as he calls it but it's just basically kind ideal. Of yeah 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 exactly yeah. but um, but and, and i wonder so he's got the kantian moment does he have the hegelian moment say so, yeah but here we are talking about it so we've gone behind the back of it which presupposes that we're not just in a simulation right yeah as far as i'm aware i think he just sort of sticks there with Kant. Well, Kant so yeah, yeah that would be interesting yeah. to get a sort of hegelian dialogue with yeah. that sort of like idea 
Um, yeah. yeah, and I want to get a better understanding too of like what is Hegel's sort of like response to Kant in order to like arrive at still uh, giving us these sort of like connections to reality. Yeah. Um, and it might just be through sort of like consciousness first priority, uh, ontological priority over the experiences, uh, uh, over the like measured experiences that we have, yeah, which exactly. is. I guess very like theistic leaning in, in, in it some sense. But. Yeah, look, I can, I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah works that. for me. <laughs> that, I mean, like, I, I often say like, you know, stuff like this is if, if my kids grew up to be like, you know, Hegelians in the philosophy of mind, I don't know. I, I don't know that I would say it all went wrong. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, okay. I think that's kind of like about where I'm, uh, what the the points that i wanted to make uh mm -hmm. caleb was there any uh question or do we want to sort of lay it out for questions or go through anything else um no i just have a question about and maybe this was addressed but so my understanding of like one of the lines you were taking jim was that maybe like we're kind of taking like if we're in a simulation but then we're kind of making an evaluation of that that mm -hmm. might at least the way I was interpreting it, that might presuppose that we have some kind of judgment independent of the simulation's effect yeah. or theoretical yeah. effect. So what yeah. about, so I'm just wondering, like what if somebody said that like some kind of foundationalism of epistemology is true and like that's going to hold regardless of whether, like they just think that's just very clear, like, you know, whether you're in a simulation or not, that certain judgments just have to hold, like how would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm really, uh, like, kind of like, you know, I, I've come out like so, like Hegelian today, right? So, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a foundationalist, right? Because so, like, if you're saying there's like, there's these incorrigible judgments we make, okay, um, I, I, I don't think there are such things. I think that any significant judgment we make is it's is corrigible, like, it, like it's something that. That's like it could go wrong for us. Now that doesn't mean I think it's going to. That doesn't mean I, I think it's at all probable that it's going to. But I do think that it's something like that could go wrong for us. Like even if you get to the level like you know, water is H two O. We always truck that out as a necessary truth, right? Okay, but that's not incorrigible. We, I mean, I don't bet on it, but we could discover tomorrow that the the atomic theory has gone seriously wrong and it's not H two at all or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, and even stuff like principle non contradiction, I think it's a cornerstone. I'm not doubting it. I don't, I'm not even claiming to know what I could doubt it on, but you know, look, it, could it, could it be that like, it turns out like we discovered something about the human, human, you know, cognitive apparatus that would force us to revise that. I'm not ruling that out. Absolutely. Right. Okay. I'm not ruling it in. I'm just not ruling it out. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's really that, that kind of recognized fallibility is what keeps humans involved in a world rather than spinning in some kind of like a priori empty space. Right. Okay, that's interesting. And then I'm wondering, since you made this comment, now I'm curious about the, the Chinese room. I was seeing some discussion about it today as well on Twitter. So why why don't you accept that argument about the, the Chinese room? Yeah, I, I mean, in my first book on Phil Mind, like I came out hard in favor of it, right? But I just, I have come to, to be convinced by a lot of people who say that it just simply begs the question, right? You know, that people will say, you know, I said, right, that look, you know, it, it, show me where the consciousness is in this system, right? And you know, the the the, the defender of the um, of the uh, the Turing test will say, there it is. It's it, it you you can see it in the linguistic behavior of of the system, no differently than you do anything else, right? Do you see what I mean? And so, uh, it seems to me like it, it it's like Searle is assuming that you just look at this and say. Oh yeah, that thing's clearly not conscious because none of the parts are, right? But the defender of the Turing test is going to say, "Well, no single part of you is conscious, right?" So it seems like, you, but you're, but you're assuming that that's not a problem in this case, and you're denying this other one, which seems to beg the question. You're just assuming you couldn't have consciousness in anything that wasn't an organism, right? Um, which is, which is exactly what the Turing people are denying, right? So I do, I do see the Turing test as begging the question now. Well, the Turing test or the, oh, no, no, the Chinese, yeah. room, Chinese room. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. No, I'm not. I'm not coming out for AI. I think there's better reasons for rejecting AI. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I no longer do it based on the the, the Turing stuff or the sorry, the Chinese room stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I could I, I could post some unpublished stuff on this. There's some lectures I've got on this that are out there. So. 
Right. Yeah, what, that would be interesting to go through. What is, but yeah, go ahead. Jim, what is your preferred view? I think I've heard you say you're not like a, a substance dualist, um, which either am I, but what is your preferred view on the, the philosophy of mind or if you have one? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm basically like moving more and more towards a kind of mysterianism, right? Okay. And I've, I've start, I, I tend now towards like one, I don't think minds and souls are the same thing. Okay. So I, I divide those questions, right? But uh, as far as mind goes, uh, increasingly, you know, I'm very compelled by Wittgenstein arguments, um, you know, arguments that you find in, in like early Heidegger, right? That are just going to press us to see, look, that minds are not anything that's internal to single organisms, whether they be material or immaterial. Okay. And increasingly I see mind as an involvement with a world, with a history, with a community, right? I see mind as something that is achieved in, in these relations and not something that's internal uh, to any one thing, whether it be a, like a disembodied ghost or whether it be a brain inside a skull, right? Uh, and actually, I have a, a book that should be coming out this year called Thinking About Thinking, where I'm going to make I, I make this case, right? So yeah, okay. how are you, are you sort of understanding the Chinese room, room to ex thought experiment to be sort of begging the question? Is it that it's sort of assuming that having a functional uh, app, uh, yeah. functional ability to converse about a subject in is identical to understanding the contents yeah. of that subject it's yeah, just well, assuming when, that off the bat yeah well or it's it's that you know searle's assuming that we're going to look at this 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 system and say well no part of it right no part of it is is conscious right no no no, no part of the system speaks chinese right mm -hmm. um and therefore like this whole thing doesn't speak chinese right whereas well it, it speaks Chinese. It just doesn't understand Chinese. Yeah, That's yeah, the point yeah. Okay, the whole thing it doesn't understand. Yeah, pardon me. It doesn't understand okay. Chinese, right? Mm -hmm. But the that a system of non non understanding parts, right, can itself constitute uh, understanding is like the very claim the Turing people are making. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And it seems like we just have to deny that in order to give the thought experiment traction. <sighs> Okay. I think a Turing person could say, no, I, I think that system uh, understands Chinese because I because I think what counts for understanding Chinese is the ability to take up the conversation, right? Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess then they just come into a conversation as to like, what does it mean to understand a concept? And well, to yeah. be able to use that concept in conversation doesn't seem adequate if you don't understand what that concept refers to. But maybe... <laughs> yeah. If like in conversation, you're referring to it properly. Yeah. And so the person that you're speaking with uh, recognizes, hey, this person yeah. understands what this concept refers to, even though the person that's speaking it doesn't yeah. actually understand yeah. the reference. So and look, I'm not I'm not defending like the, the functionalist view, but what the functionalist mm -hmm. is going to say is, look, uh, yeah, uh, s syntax takes really good syntax takes care of semantics. There's nothing more needed. Right. Mm -hmm. In order to have the semantics, then that you can use the word under the proper conditions. Right. It's a denial that you need some part that has intrinsic understanding in order for the whole to have the understanding. Right. It's just it's just a flat denial of that. And I mm -hmm. think by coming up with this thought experiment, we're just ignoring what the actual claim that the functionalist is making is. Right. Do, do you see that? Right. So what if the the purpose of the Chinese uh, th Chinese room thought experiment is not to say not to beg the question, but it's just at least to sort of make clear the point that there's a difference between having a semantic understanding and a syntactic understanding. Because like yeah. if the functionalist is sort of committed to the position that the Chinese room understands what it's saying, but um, the person in that room does not understand what they're the saying. And there's a way that you can like redo the room to where it's just mm -hmm. a person that's memorized all, yeah, all the yeah. things that they're supposed to say. And so there's no room. It's just a person that yeah. memorizes is the exact syllables that he's supposed to respond yeah. with in order to like do the conversation. And so like, if it's just used as a thought experiment to sort of like Mary's room to show that there's something more here than just physical facts, that's yeah. not what the Chinese room uh, thought experiment is doing, but just to show yeah. that there's something more here than just a syntactic like ability to uh, produce conversation, uh, ha have an adequate conversational skill. Yeah, I, I just, I, I just think the functionalists say, well, no, our claim is this is what understanding is, right? Mm -hmm. do, do you see that? 
and, yeah. and you and I and Searle say, but no, there has to be something intrinsic to it, right? Yeah. Do, do you see that? But yeah. I don't think the the thought experiment shows that there has to be. I agree there has to be something intrinsic to it, but I don't think that thought experiment shows that there has to be something intrinsic to it because I think I think the function say, no, this is exactly what we're talking about. Look, th this right. would be nothing intrinsically understands it, but yet we get perfectly good linguistic comp competence. And my relationship mm -hmm. to the Chinese room then is no different than my relationship to Caleb, right? So mm -hmm. what's good for the goose, good for the gander, right? But then are they committed to the position that the English speaker who's carrying a conversation and an English speaker who's carrying on a Chinese conversation are identical in some sense in regards to their conscious um, understanding of the words that they're speaking? Because it seems to me very obvious that for me who understands the concepts, like yeah. when I have the concept of a dog and I say the yeah. English word dog, that I have a, yeah. a sort of connection there. And then when I have yeah. when i just use this sort of term whatever the, the chinese word is yeah. for for dog and i use it conversationally there's going to be a difference there and so like is it yeah. like i don't know <laughs> i don't know maybe it's yeah. just foot stamping nope. but <laughs> it seems like yeah, no, even I mean, functionalist <laughs> be able no, to i understand, this, I, totally understand. I i think what a, what a good functionalist is going to say is consciousness has nothing to do with it right uh that they're, they're trying to show that the the consciousness story about it has nothing to do with the semantics right then doesn't that make functionalism an uh inadequate account of consciousness oh yeah yeah totally totally yeah okay. yeah <laughs> totally, yeah yeah exactly okay. right yeah i mean yeah but it's, if yeah by denying the relevance of consciousness that you're not giving a good account of consciousness right but does that show though thereby that the that the the chinese room does not understand i don't think mm -hmm. we've shown that right did you see it because it would beg the question i agree right. hey there seems to be nothing that qualitatively or um in 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 has like does consciousness play a role right mm -hmm. in the chinese room okay therefore the chinese room doesn't understand but the functionalist is saying you don't need consciousness for understanding i see like what yeah. consciousness is is functional it's just being able to play the role right yeah and like right. i guess yeah since if we understand understanding <laughs> as just a sort of function that a thing does then that yeah probably people that are more uh realist in regards to consciousness are going to want to deny that yeah just because you have an understanding it's not yeah. going to be identical to being conscious yeah. of that subject yeah. because consciousness is something more than that yeah okay yeah. yeah that is interesting yeah i'm glad we sort of talked through that yeah, that, yeah, yeah if, you, if you could once sometime we could do a show on this right you know we could yeah. talk ai and i can give you my my full spooky view right <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure yeah yeah I, yeah I'd, i definitely want to re uh read through uh john Searle's paper on that that'd, that'd be good yeah yep all right all right is there anything else that jim or john you guys want to share before we close the stream no I, that's probably good for me how about you john no, no, I'm good too. Yeah, I'm really happy Excellent. with the conversation we had here. Yeah, me too. I'm honored. I'm honored that we got that you that you took the time to respond, John. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> awesome. So, thanks for doing that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I, I mean, I was like listening to it in my car, I was like, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but it, it was great to be able to just sort of vocalize the, yeah. the thoughts I was having and, and get a better awesome. clarification talking with you just now. So, yep. Oh, it looks like we do have a quick question. Yeah, let's so. Do it. To blend simulation theory and Mysterianism, would you say that Mysterianism is the same as Mario could not figure out his controller inputs? I like that. I'm not, I'm not sure if I fully agree, but I, I actually like that. I want to think about that a bit. Yeah. I, th I think there's, right. it's, that's something like what I'm up to. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing within the world of Mario in which he can like determine like what, what the inputs are. That's where he can sit back and say, but aren't I running this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, nice. Yeah, well, we'll have to have another discussion again in the future. Well, I'll go ahead and close it out. Thanks, everybody. Oh, also, watching. I should mention, oh. I have, I have yeah, a website, jdmadden.com, jdmadden.com. Okay. And um, if you go there, you can find some papers I have on intelligent design, not intelligent design, um, artificial intelligence uh, and that sort of thing. So some follow-up stuff there. Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll put that in the description as well. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for coming on. I hope everyone has a good day.